Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel, we have Physicians Committee, 465,000 subscribers, but this video is entitled Type 1 Diabetes, Reduce Insulin Needs with a Plant-Based Diet. Now, I'm going to save all the comments that I have for the actual reaction, but you may already see a problem here. But anyway, we're just going to jump directly into this. I was actually recommended this video by a specific user. I will put you guys up on the screen, but just like always, before we get started, please subscribe to the Patreon if you haven't already to gain access to one week early uploads, ad-free content, uncensored content, and one extra video per week. And also buy my book Contraindicated if you have not already. And just a side note, I am working currently on the second edition of that book, which I am planning to release once my current edition has been out for an entire year. With all that being said, now let's jump directly into this video and see what they have to say. <laughs> Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and today we are talking about type... The weight loss champion. Good. ...diabetes and diet, and what are the benefits of eating a plant-based diet for someone who is suffering from type 1 diabetes? Well, well um, there may be some, especially if you load up on a bunch of fiber um, and you consume plants that don't contain that many carbohydrates that are broken down into glucose, such as fiber, for example. Um, so you may have benefits with respect to diabetes in that respect. And in, fa in fact, you do tend to see that, albeit only by a slight amount, because if you look at people that adopt a plant-based diet and you look at their A1C levels, which yes, A1C levels are conditional, but they can be good measures, especially when it comes to people that are consuming carbohydrates. Well, you tend to see that they level out at about 6.0%, maybe about 5.9, 5.8. I believe that 6.5% is diabetic. So, still not the absolute best. Anyway. Of clinical research here at the Physicians Committee has just released a groundbreaking study on the benefits of a plant based diet for. Well, no, because you just said the word benefits, and benefits is a cause and effect statement. Benefit implies that there is a direct causal correlation between the diet and any beneficial or what's colloquially deemed beneficial heart health outcome, which is also an opinion. Because when we talk about the heart health outcomes, are we actually talking about heart health outcomes or are we talking about biomarkers? Because you guys tend to cite those a lot, which are not conferring of health. Health being, well, typically, and in my opinion, most accurately defined, if we're going to find a definition for health, the absence of disease process. So, no... There are no studies to inform upon cause and effect relationships such as the one that you just put forth fallaciously and erroneously. Irresponsibly is a better word to use here. Type 1 diabetes, to talk all about that is our very own Dr. Hanna Kaliova. Dr. Kaliova, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Chuck. This is exciting. We call it groundbreaking research because it really is. A lot of people who have type 1 diabetes, Dr. Kaliova, think, I've got it now and there's really not much I can do about it. So, Well, that's false. You can do something about it, very fortunately. The most conducive approach to lowering one's blood glucose levels to a healthy level, an indicated level, with someone that has type 1 or type 2 diabetes, actually, is significantly reducing carbohydrate consumption to, frankly, um, about zero if you can. That's what's indicated. In a type 1 diabetic, what you would do is you would inject insulin because you require the insulin, but it would be far, far, far less insulin and far more seldomly injected than if you consumed heaping amounts of carbohydrates in every single meal. And also, there's sort of a begging the question fallacy right there, saying, implying that one should be consuming multiple meals a day. Two max is what I typically say. One is ideal if you can do it. And you can actually get all of your protein requirements in that one meal. That's what's important here. But anyway, that's what you would do. 
actually, because what is the thing that is actually the pathology in diabetes? No matter the form. Different causes of the pathology, but what is the pathology? Chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else. It damages blood vessels, arteries. So, there you go. That's the thing going to live with it, but you and your team of researchers have found out that diet still plays a huge role in type 1 diabetes. Correct. That's exactly right. Uh, you know, almost 13% of the U.S. population have diabetes. The majority of the cases is type 2 diabetes. Um, that, and that has been... Only 13%? Perhaps, but... I actually put these statistics in the prologue of my book, Contraindicated. If you have not bought that book already, please go ahead and buy that. Link is in the description below. Um, but I can't remember, and I believe that the values were absolute values and not percentages. So that might be why that doesn't sound familiar. It's still quite a lot of people. We should really be using absolute statistics more and absolute values more than anything else. Uh, the main focus of our research, you know, for quite some time. And now we moved into the area of type 1 diabetes, which is which is an autoimmune condition. And it's almost always there is an argument to make that type 2 actually does trend towards type 1 because of the fatiguing of the beta cells. I think this term fatiguing is just ridiculous because cells don't fatigue like that. There is damage that they incur. They're a cell like every other cell in the body, so they incur and sustain damage from glucose. They can only divide and divide and divide as quickly as other cells can, and as they themselves can for only a short amount of time, or sorry, only a certain amount of time before that process begins to slow down. So that seems to be what's actually causing this fatiguing, not actual fatigue because chemical equilibria don't fatigue. But anyway, yes, type 2 in extreme cases does tend to trend towards a phenomenon that is pretty much congruous with type 1. It's identical. So anyway, that's me being, you could say pedantic, but I think that also is important though. Usually diagnosed during childhood or adolescence. And um, about 40,000 new cases are diagnosed in the U.S. each year. And, um, you know, the conventional wisdom is, you know, count your carbs and uh, dose your insulin accordingly. Uh, right. So you should count your car. Well, I mean, here's the thing. You shouldn't be counting your carbs anyway, because if you're counting them, then you're eating them, aren't you? Shouldn't be doing that. So there's the problem right there. But here is something that I should actually talk about right now, this whole autoimmunity thing. It's colloquially believed and stated to be the case that autoimmunity is, well, the body attacking itself. And, of course, to an extent that's true, um, but it sort of implies that the motive, it, that it's some sort of confusion by the body. Now... Sure, but the body isn't stupid. It really seems to be the case that autoimmunity is a situation where the body is attacking something. Its target is something. But there is shrapnel involved, let's say. that This, this doesn't actually happen in the body, but I'm trying to use an, an analogy here. And the body can sustain damage from that. The body also has a tendency to latch on to certain proteins that are domestic in the body and attack those when it targets something else that is similar in structure. It creates antibodies and it's against other things. Um, what tends to happen though is that when people cut out the inflammatory compounds in their diet, when the inflammation starts to subside, so does the autoimmunity. Now, a lot of the inflammation they were sustaining was no doubt because of the autoimmune condition itself. But since it's the case that when you cut out the inflammation, the autoimmunity surceases, well, 
it's just a, I think it's, it's an interesting inference there. So yes, type one diabetes is an autoimmune condition and it is lifelong when it occurs. Other autoimmune conditions do not seem to be lifelong at all. Um, and they can be ameliorated with proper approach. Our study actually showed that a plant-based diet can be a breakthrough for people with type 1 diabetes. Well, really, when you say can be, what you should be saying is maybe. Because the word can means necessarily that it has at least once been proven to cause those beneficial effects. So no, may be, and I just explained why that makes sense, actually. It does not mean that it is the absolute indicated approach for human physiology. And in fact, it isn't. And if you want to know more, if you want to know the reasons why, I would suggest binging my channel or continue watching this video because I probably will get into it. So when we're talking about a breakthrough, I, I think that that's, that's huge given the cost of medication, given the cost of treatment. Um, and, and I don't want to spoil it here, but we're talking about a pretty significant reduction in the amount of insulin that a person ordinarily would need, correct? That's exactly right. Uh, and that was associated with the diet. Sure. And I'm not, I'm not pretending like it wasn't the diet. I'm just trying to use scientifically disciplined language here. And I'm actually not trying to, I'm doing it. I do believe that it was the diet. I think that it, it's silly to believe otherwise in this situation. However, that's an opinion. That's a subjective interpretation. Decreased insulin dose, uh, which comes with um, health benefits, but also financial benefits and cost savings. All right. And for those who aren't really 100% familiar, kind of glossed over this a little bit, but the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes is what now? The difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes is the case that the first type, the former type, type 1, is a condition where the beta cells of the pancreas either secrete insufficient or no insulin whatsoever which prevents glucose in the bloodstream, whether it be created endogenously or consumed exogenously, cannot enter cells that contain GLUT4 receptors on them. Those include your fat cells, those include your muscle cells, and those also include your brain cells. It is a deadly condition because of the chronically elevated blood glucose that wreaks havoc on the body but also because of the cellular starvation that occurs. It leads to excessive amounts. And well, really, we're saying excessive. I'm saying excessive, but it's not excessive. It's exactly what the body is designed to do given the circumstances. But it creates a significant amount of ketone bodies through e extreme amounts of beta oxidation and particularly ketogenesis in the liver, which becomes so exorbitant that it causes ketoacidosis if the type 1 diabetes is not controlled via the change in ATOT concentration in the blood plasma that decreases pH, prevents your enzymes from working properly, and you will die. That's type 1 diabetes. They just explained the cause of it. There you go. Autoimmunity. Type 2 diabetes is a condition that is caused by the consumption of carbohydrates and nothing else. You cannot have truly pathological type 2 diabetes if you are not consuming carbohydrates to some degree. I don't care if you're eating a bunch of seed oils, which you shouldn't be doing. That may lower, and I think it probably will, lower the threshold that one would have to attain or surpass in order to develop type 2 diabetes. But in order to actually exhibit the condition, you have to be consuming carbohydrates to some degree. Type 2 diabetes seems to be a Randall cycle situation and basically um, one that continues for decades and decades and causes, well, glycation damage, which causes the cell division process to slow down further and further. Um, and also cellular processes such as 
fatty acid synthesis from excess glucose in the bloodstream. Very multifaceted issue. At the end of the day, the root cause absolutely is carbohydrate consumption, however. That is type 2 diabetes. Both of them are deadly. Type 1 diabetes is more deadly, actually. And it happens sooner, usually, than type 2. However, many, 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 many children are coming down with type 2 diabetes. That's been the case for decades, and it's happening more and more in droves. So that's just another important note. Sometimes it doesn't take decades to develop type 2 diabetes. Sometimes it takes one or two. So just depends on your individual genes. Uh, so uh, this is an excellent question. Uh, diabetes is a condition uh, characterized by a high blood sugar level, you know, or sustained high blood sugar levels. Particularly blood glucose levels, actually. And the reason why that's important is because other people don't realize that, well, just because you exhibit a lower blood glucose level does not mean that you are not sustaining excess glycation damage from things like fructose. Which, by the way, Mr. Dr. Paul Saladino is not registered on an HbA1c test. No matter how much you wish it to be, it is not. Now, uh, in both cases, uh, insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction are involved as, as pathophysiologic mechanisms. No. You see that? So, the, the prefix patho indicates pathology. The pathology is not insulin resistance. That is a physiologically adaptive response to a stimulus. That stimulus being, well, a Randall cycle activation. Please go ahead and check out the video I did with Bart K recently on this. And also go ahead and check out the response video to Ben Bickman's breakdown of the Randall cycle to learn more about this. Um, and Ben, if you're watching, or the audience that's watching, if you want to try and get a hold of Ben and try and get him to come up on the channel, I'm still awaiting a response from your team. It's probably not you directly. Um, I invited you on to the show to talk about that mechanism in further detail because I think it's extremely important. And I think it's important to recognize that insulin is not a dictator of fuel use. That's just an unequivocal fact because if that were the case, then insulin resistance itself wouldn't even exist. But yeah, it's a Randall cycle situation. The problem, the pathology, is the carbohydrate consumption, okay? The glycation is the pathology, really. In terms of beta cell dysfunction, that still comes back down to carbohydrates. Come back down. Uh, what is insulin resistance? Uh, it's well, I just explained that, didn't I? I covered that. Your pancreas is working, uh, your beta cells in the pancreas are still releasing insulin, uh, but your cells are not as sensitive to uh, to its function. Okay, that's actually correct. They're not as sensitive to insulin as they otherwise were before, um, but there are reasons for that, and that's what we covered, uh, Professor Barkay and I, in a video that was, at the time of recording, released yesterday on YouTube publicly. So, and that was a private discussion we had that was sort of an extemporaneous, Im improvised, let's start recording because this is important kind of thing. Um, we have private discussions on this stuff a lot. So. Uh, they're kind of like the door lock is jammed and uh, the glucose cannot get, get inside the cells because the insulin receptors are not, uh, you know, uh, reacting properly. Ah, uh, see, that's where you went wrong. They are reacting properly. The cell is purposely preventing the entry of glucose into them. It is a mechanism by which the cell protects itself from glycation. In fact, I'm actually pretty impressed. Wikipedia has this correct. <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Uh, the whole article is impressive because it seems like they changed it from the last time I checked it a year or two ago. It's pretty damn accurate now, uh, what they have on Wikipedia about the Randall cycle. Um... I think they should put more emphasis on the fact that both pathways cross inhibit one another. Um, but either way, they have it pretty straight, pretty bang on. Um, but the cell is purposely preventing entry of glucose into them because of typically um, not excessive. I keep wanting to use the word excessive. I should not be doing that. Uh, a significant amount of beta oxidation occurring within 
a cell. Also, ketone metabolism. Ketone metabolism can inhibit glycolysis. Absolutely it can. It's just that ketone metabolism and glycolysis don't cross inhibit one another. Fatty acid oxidation and glycolysis cross inhibit one another. Different. It's different. So anyway, um, it's because the energy level in that cell is totally fine. And there's significant amounts of, of, of beta oxidation occurring. And so the cell doesn't need that glucose. And in fact, if it sequestered that glucose and couldn't use it immediately because of the significant amount of beta oxidation, it would incur glycation damage, which is exactly why we say that the Randall cycle is a mechanism by which the cell protects itself from damage. At the end of the day, the thing that actually causes the damage, the actual pathology of diabetes, no matter the manifestation, is carbohydrate consumption. It is glycation damage from carbohydrate consumption. Okay, try and experience excessive glycation damage from gluconeogenically produced glucose. It's possible if you consume enough protein, it seems, but that also seems difficult for people to do. It's, it's much more difficult to overconsume protein than it is to overconsume carbohydrates. Let's put it that way. So that's insulin resistance. And there's also... She did actually a pretty good job at elucidating that. The problem was the cells fail to respond properly. No, the body is a tightly controlled, very, very um, intuitive machine. It has evolved for, our genes have evolved for billions of years. They absolutely know what they're doing. So. Um, a component of beta cell dysfunction or ultimately failure where this is what I was talking about where type 2 tends to trend toward trend towards type 1. People have made the argument that it's not it's still not type 1 and you can make that argument um, but I disagree. Type 1 diabetes is characterized by an insufficient amount or completely absent amount which would still be insufficient of insulin being released. Uh, in a response to glucose concentration in the bloodstream. That's type 1 diabetes. That's Mayo Clinic's working definition. If someone has a different working definition that they can cite from the medical professionals, go ahead and enlighten me, please. But that is the definition, so type 2 does have the tendency to trend towards type 1. Okay? Even if the cause of a disease is different, that doesn't mean that if the disease was caused by something different, that the disease is different. The cause was different. The number of beta cells in the pancreas is just decreasing over the course of, of the disease in both cases. In both Right, and why would that be happening? That, that's the next question that you should be asking. And I think I already covered that because that's not a normal, that's not a normal situation. Um, and it takes a long time for that to occur, actually, typically. Once again... <sighs> younger children are coming down with it. In terms of beta cell dysfunction, not sure about that. But diabetes, yes. Type 2. 2 and type 1 diabetes. And eventually it reaches a, a point where um, the, the pancreas is not working sufficiently to offset the high blood sugar levels. Correct. Absolutely correct, ma'am. But I've sort of already covered why that, that seems to be the case. Because the thing is, once again, the human body is a set, and a set is putting it lightly, of chemical equilibria. And what does that mean? I mean, equilibria is the plural of equilibrium, but what does that really mean? Why am I saying that? Why does that prove this whole... Why does it disprove this fatiguing situation? Well, because think of an equilibrium as your glass of water. In fact, that actually is an example of an equilibrium. A lot of people think an equilibrium is just a static, no movement, kind of just... just balance, let's say. But it's not. In fact, actually, your glass of water is a set of reactions going back and forth extremely fast. Um, how fast? Uh, less than one millionth of a second, actually. And so, no matter how long this water sits here, this equilibrium will persist, even if there is an, an attempt to perturb it. Um, it doesn't matter if it sits here for two decades or 200,000 years, it will persist because it's the law of, it's a law of the universe. 
In the body, same situation. Let's take insulin resistance, for example. When people say, well, uh, you know, insulin, if it's high enough for long enough, um, then the cells sort of experience tinnitus to insulin. It just fails to respond to it. Um, no, because does that happen with your water? I mean, your water doesn't just get tired of performing the same reaction back and forth and then just explode because of failing to meet the, the law of electroneutrality. Okay, that, that's not what happens. <laughs> um, it will always persist. Same thing with the body. You can have cellular dysfunction, but that would be a stim it, It's not tinnitus to insulin. Uh, and it's actually not even cellular dysfunction that causes insulin resistance. It doesn't seem. It seems to be a stimulus from inside the cell to prevent the entry of glucose. I'm sure that cellular dysfunction can have a role to play from... I don't know, uh, glycation damage, you know, sort of goes back to the cellular division thing that I was talking about, but there is an opposing stimulus, for example. But anyway, the fatiguing of beta cells, they don't fatigue, they don't just fail to perform their process because that is sort of congruous with saying that there's tinnitus, there's a stimulus and then it just fails to respond because it can't. No, there's something else going on and it seems to be, once again, a slowing down of cellular division and that's due to glycation damage of the cells by glucose because they are a cell just like any other cell in the body and they're therefore susceptible to damage um, like glycation. So. And uh, we're talking about in type 2 diabetes, the insulin resistance being more on the forefront and in type 1 diabetes, it's more the beta cell dysfunction and ultimately failure be being the frontier. Yes, um, type 1 diabetes, that is just genuinely, that is absolutely the case. Um, type 2, once again, severe enough can trend towards type 1. Um, usually you have other complications before that, though, that'll get you. Um, but just depends on who you are and what your genes are um, encoded to do. Which you do have some influence over, but not complete influence, or else we would all be... We could all, if we did the same things, be the same person, but... <laughs> uh, but both of these mechanisms are involved in both cases. And uh, this is critical to understand because uh, in our study, we actually improved the insulin sensitivity component in type 1 diabetes. Also. Well, that's good. And I'm glad. Um, with a plant-based diet, that is definitely possible. I have a friend, um, my best friend, actually, who has a grandparent who actually ameliorated his cancer with a plant-based diet. Now, I sort of joke around with him, not the grandparent, my friend, and I tell him, I go, well, good luck trying to convince him to go carnivore then, because, you know, if something saves your life, good luck trying to convince someone of not doing that. Um, however, it is not the most indicated approach for human physiology. Uh, either way, though, if someone healed their issues, that that's a good thing. So, but it seems to be the case that the reason for that is, first of all, you decrease the amount of inflammation that you are sustaining because you cut out a bunch of fat. Not that fat is inflammatory, but fat and carbs together, Randall's cycle, um, creates inflammation in the body, redox potential, all that stuff. Um, but also, you seem to actually blunt a glucose spike, which can help because the body can sparingly deal with the glucose instead of having a huge rush of it. Sure. Um, and also, some of these people indirectly lower their carbon take because they're eating a lot more fiber and a lot of fibrous plants have naturally lower levels of carbohydrates. Um, they start to eat less in general as well, though, which is a problem, I think. Um... Anyway, multifaceted issue. At the end of the day, a plant-based diet is effective at ameliorating diabetes. However, not as conducively and effectively as a carnivore diet. That's from my perspective. And uh, that led to lower insulin dose and lower insulin requirements in these, in these people. 
All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the study. I know that you've uh, done uh, what Dr. Cal does best and put together a fantastic presentation for us. So what I'm going to do is I will pull the slides up for the benefit of people who are watching on YouTube and Facebook right now. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, we're going to drop a link to the presentation as well in the show description for you. So uh, with that said, Dr. Kaliova, I'm going to turn the stage completely over to you and take it away. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Chuck. So the effect of a dietary intervention on insulin requirements in type 1 diabetes. Okay, so two problems I see already. So you said the word effect, which is the conjugate of cause, and there are no studies to inform upon a cause and effect relationship to prove one, as that relates to any externality whatsoever, whether it be dietary or other lifestyle uh, interventions, and the supposed effects of that on heart health outcomes in human beings over any given period of time throughout the entire time inferential statistics has existed because inferential statistics makes no claim about causality and cannot prove causality um, unless you have additional machinery which you know anyway also the other problem is that this is a 12 week study so the results of this study even if they were able to establish cause and effect results um at all can only be extrapolated to a 12-week protocol let's say 12-week protocol that's it what was the demographic of people first of all um because those are the only types of people that these results can apply to um this whole human nutrition science mumbo jumbo is completely nonsensical it is completely Bread and circuses, really. Um, and I talk about that in my book as well, chapter one. Once again, go ahead and buy that. If you have not already, of course. So I really don't want to see this. I'm not going to pretend like a diet um, that is plant-based can't help or won't help with type 1 diabetes. Of course it can. Um, but this study doesn't prove that. We did a 12-week randomized clinical trial was this clinical? Were these people locked in labs in metabolic wards? And was every single aspect of their life controlled? And were these people genetically identical twins, both phenotypically and genotypically identical? And were they separated at birth and put into these wards? I suspect not. Um, but let's um, take a step back and let's review the nutrition goals in general for people with type 1 diabetes. Well, this is an opinion. So you should probably state that as such, given that you are a figure of authority that is essential, actually. You need to be responsible in that respect. And I know I can come off like an asshole when I say stuff like this, but, you know, I'm not going to be overly anodyne here on this channel. I'm not going to be, because that's not indicated in our current um, societal state at all. In fact, we're, we're living in the biggest silent genocide possibly in history. And it's directly related to this stuff. So, Then we'll explore the benefits of a plant-based diet for people with type 1 diabetes. Right. Well, I just covered the whole word benefits and things. If you're going to use the word benefit, you need to specify that that is your opinion. I think that the carnivore diet is beneficial for people, but that's an opinion because no studies can inform upon whether something is beneficial or not because that's a cause and effect statement. So what can be actually achieved? What's reasonable to expect um, with nutrition for people with type 1 diabetes? What does that mean, by the way? I'm, I'm sure that we'll figure it out, but I'm just wondering beforehand. I'm live reacting. The nutrition goals are well beyond glycemic control. It's not only about blood sugar control. Uh, we... mm, okay. Um... With diabetes, I mean, that, that is the problem, though, because the glycation is the pathology. So... Improve all the cardiometabolic markers, such as body weight and blood pressure and blood... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Cardiometabolic factors? Is that what she said? I mean, that's basically what she said. So are you saying risk factors? Is, is that what you're... Because you can't establish risk because risk is also a cause and effect statement. There is no such thing as risk factor or a risk factor. 
Not a thing. Okay? There are judicious inferences you can make about what would be and what possibly are the best um, risk indicators. Blood pressure is a good one, but that's also an opinion. But anyway, I'm just repeating myself now. Uh, let's look at this. So you're saying that not only do you want better glycemic control in people whenever you are intervening with them dietarily, I already disagreed with that. I think that's the thing because everything else will fall into line because everything else seems to be symptomatic because the pathology with diabetes is glycation damage. There you go. Now, let's look though. She says that the other goals that they would like to achieve are body weight. Okay, well, that implies that your body weight is a cause of disease, first and foremost. It also implies that there is a set body weight goal for every single person, which there is, but that's determined by your... Usually, that once again is one of those factors that falls into line given the right um, dietary and lifestyle stimuli. And by right, I mean indicated. So you shouldn't focus on body weight. By body weight, weight is not a criterion of health. It is a symptom almost always. I mean, it really is. Increased adiposity, which is reflected in one's increased body weight, um, you know, transgressing from what is um, normally set by that person's body or has been, um, is a symptom of poor dietary input. Not even poor lifestyle behavior, um, most of the time. It's poor dietary input. Okay, so you shouldn't be focusing on body weight. Also, what what do you mean by weight? Weight is constituted of a lot of different things. So, once again, if you focus on body weight, then that means that you would call it a win if someone lost 10 pounds, if that's your goal, to get them to lose 10 pounds, no matter, irrespective of what form of weight that is in. Fat? Well, that would be a good thing, most likely. If they're containing, if they have a lot of excess adiposity. Muscle? Not so much. So, no. Blood pressure. Already talked about that. That's fine, I think. But you need to specify that that's just an opinion. And that was your goal. That was your personal goal. And that's fine. Blood lipids. Well, check out my cholesterol and heart disease playlist and you'll find out that lipids, no, no matter whether it's a lipoprotein that we're talking about or actual cholesterol... Uh, they have no bearing on one's risk of heart disease development, in fact. If that were the case, then heart disease would occur in veins as well as arteries, and it doesn't. Uh, not only that, if it were still a cause of it, but it only occurred in arteries because of the fact that oxygen, oxygenated blood is carried in arteries and the oxidation of lipoproteins can cause, is, is what causes heart disease, then it would occur as a blanket across the entire arterial side of the vasculature. And it doesn't. It occurs in set sites. And those set sites just so happen to be the places in the vasculature that experience the most turbulence and therefore pressure um, exertion for longer periods of time than other parts of the vasculature in hypertensive situations. High blood pressure is the cause of heart disease. What causes high blood pressure? That is chronic and contraindicated, because there are times during exercise, for example, where it is indicated, it's necessary. Inflammation. What causes inflammation? Well, binge my channel and find out about that. One of the things that's most relevant to this video is glucose exogenously introduced. Really, we should say glucose above a physiological concentration within the bloodstream, um, ab above a certain homeostatic physiological concentration within the bloodstream. But that's what we should say. It's most conducively achieved, almost invariably achieved, by consuming the f***ing thing. So, pardon my French. It's, we also want to see an improved quality of life and delayed uh, complications of diabetes. Uh, right, so all of this would occur, besides the blood lipids, uh, which doesn't matter anyway, um, in the case of better glycemic control. It may take longer to occur. It's like a cut healing. You remove the stimulus though, and well, it'll start healing. Now, we know that the risk of dying from any cause is higher in people with type 1 diabetes. No, not risk. That's an opinion. 
Okay, no matter how silly you think it is, and this goes for, I'm not just talking to this woman here, I'm talking to anyone watching this video, no matter how silly you think it is to say what I just said, where it's not risk, it, it's an association, it doesn't mean that you can say risk. Well, it's obvious that, nope, immediately I'm going to cut you off right there. Ob obviously, I think that it's obvious that it's due to type 1 diabetes causing death. We know that it does cause death and we know the mechanisms as to why. But as soon as you frame it like this, oh, more mortality in people with type 1 diabetes, you still can't say risk because now you framed it in an associative way. We cannot sacrifice scientific discipline for appeal to consensus, no matter what. But anyway, I'm going to be a little more forgiving because yes, it, it is pretty obvious that people with type 1 diabetes are going to exhibit higher mortality. And this says, this says particularly we're talking about the duration of the diabetes. And that makes it even more ambiguous because then it's like, well, you know, anyway. With non-diabetic population, and this gap increases with the, the duration of diabetes. And that's mainly because of the cardiovascular deaths, the, um, you know, the heart disease and, uh, and the myocardial infar infarction. Now, now here, that's, that's true. However, what causes the cardiovascular problems? It's the elevated blood glucose. Always remember that. Now, the DCCT EDIC study in 14... Unfamiliar with that. Over 1,400 participants with a follow-up of 30 years showed that an increased insulin dose is associated with a higher body mass index. So people... What a shock. This leads to what Ben Bickman, in my response video to Ben Bickman, uh, in the video I was responding to of Ben Bickman, actually said uh, people realize that whenever they actually start injecting insulin and they're eating a bunch of carbohydrates because that's what their doctor told them to do they start gaining a lot of fat and so they actually deliberately underdose the insulin in order to stay thin and they ride the line of death actually so it's an eating disorder it still is actually who use insulin for quite some time, they tend to be heavier and put on some weight over time. It's also associated with a higher heart rate and uh, impaired blood lipids. So no, not impaired blood lipids, ma'am, because impaired implies that your body producing or encoding for the production of lipoproteins that carry the cholesterol through the body, any excess, by the way, being excreted in the bile doesn't just stick in your arteries. That's not how that works. Learn some biochemistry, learn some lipoprotein metabolism, and you'll understand that is somehow flawed. Our genes have evolved for billions of years. They know what they're doing. It's not impaired lipid metabolism. If anything, even if lipids and cholesterol and lipoproteins were causal in heart disease. The fact that your body is producing more of the lipoproteins and more cholesterol, let's say, usually it's more of the lipoproteins, does not necessarily mean the body is doing something wrong. There's another stimulus at play that you need to cut out that you're doing yourself. Your genes aren't the problem because they've evolved for billions of years under positive and negative selection pressures. They know what the hell they're doing. But Fortunately, lipids and any lipoproteins are not causal at all in heart disease whatsoever. I don't care if your level is 700. Total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, I don't care. Okay, it may be indicative of something else going on if someone presents with symptoms. But the problem is still not the lipoprotein production. It's something else. Um it's in in other words it's, it's associated with a, a higher risk of cardiovascular disease no not higher risk because risk is a cause and effect statement if you think that's your opinion state it as such if you're going to invoke human nutrition science and inferential statistics you have to completely change your verbiage in order to maintain responsibility each a uh, 0.1 unit of insulin per kilogram per day 
was associated with a 6% increased risk of cardiovascular disease. You almost had it. Remove the word risk. It was associated with an increased incidence of cardiovascular disease of a value of 6%. Association. There you go. But you see why it's important. Now that she just said risk, what are you going to think? Increased insulin raises your risk of cardiovascular disease. Boom. Done. Slam dunk. Well, no, it doesn't. That's not true. Per se. Let's just put it that way. Per se. Because there could be many other things at play that are more plausible. And in fact, well, I wonder what it is. Goodness. Perhaps it's the glucose? Perhaps it's the excessive storing of fat into the cardiac muscle itself that inhibits its ability to perform its functions as well, because that can happen. Study. Now, uh, what can we do with nutrition? The conventional... You could cut out the thing that induces the damage itself, which is the glucose, and therefore have a very... Um, seldomly occurring insulin injection that's indicated or indicated insulin injection that must occur to control blood sugar levels in a type 1 diabetic. Now, see what's on the screen here is completely contraindicated, odious slop, um, to put it not so lightly. However, what you can say because we like to be objective here on this channel, is that the amount of actual carbohydrate consumption that excludes fiber is very low. That should give you a hint as to why plant-based diets can help ameliorate diabetes. This is mostly fiber and is not broken down readily into glucose. There you go. There's your clue. Um, is just count carbs and you know calculate how many how many units of insulin you need for each meal and that's it about that's pretty simple and in fact it's effective and when we say cut carbs what we really should mean is eliminate them to as much of a degree as you can nobody needs to be consuming 50 grams i i think no matter who you are 20 grams is my cutoff and i tend to stay below that as well in an ideal world, I'd cut it down to zero. I used to do that. Um, but I visit people's houses, and sometimes there's some goodies there. And I'll go, eh, well, five grams doesn't hurt, ten grams doesn't hurt. Which it does, actually. Just <laughs> not as much um, as if you ate more. Addiction's a very powerful thing. Fortunately, we don't keep carbs in my house. So, well our house my girlfriend would kill me if you heard me say that so okay like you know stay away from the complete junk try to eat generally healthy but that's about the conventional wisdom well what does that mean sorry i'm a little late to the pause uh, generally healthy i mean well the, the, when they say generally healthy any impressionable person is going to just follow the guidelines generally healthy doesn't even imply following the guidelines actually either it's just it's just vague and it, it's it's in order to be inoffensive and anodyne and all that stuff and yeah which is funny because they tend to be the most offensive people in the medical sphere by being arrogant but anyway um actually you know what now that i think about it it's not to be anodyne or inoffensive maybe for some people but it's also because that's what they're told to tell people because since it means nothing, generally healthy means nothing, well, that ensures that they remain sick and then they can profit off of you. It is a shame. It sounds conspiratorial, um, but it's not. It's just a fact now. I hate that it is, but, you know, not going to just deny the truth. So We know that in type 2 diabetes, um, a plant-based diet can reverse the course in many cases sometimes that's an opinion you're referring to science you cannot use the word can you must use the word may 
people get rid of their diabetes, um, you know, completely. Sometimes we see significant improvements. It's also important to mention once again to allude to the beginning. When we say ameliorate diabetes, that means two different things, effectively. With these people's verbiage, it means to basically attain an HbA1c level of below 6.5% but they could raise that to 8.0% and then say you ameliorated your diabetes if you lower it to 7.5%. See how it's a problem? Because really, effectively, you're still diabetic. It's just not called diabetes because apparently to them, diabetes just means attaining a certain threshold in terms of an HbA1c value. My definition is sustaining just the indicated amount of glycation damage because that does happen, that will happen, even with endogenously created glucose. That's just something that happens. For example, we age. That's sort of our body falling apart. We can't prevent that. We can prevent the rate at which it occurs by living an indicated lifestyle, but you're still going to age. Well, you're still going to sustain some glycation damage. That happens. But you attain the least amount <laughs> possible. And so I infer it from a fructosamine assay, or I would if I were a physician in this case. Not even a fasting blood glucose, not even a fasting insulin level, actually. To find out more as to why, they're better indicators for sure, um, absolutely. But to find out why that is, I would recommend watching my video I did on Dr. Suresh Kawadkar. Um, that's a long one. Grab your carnivore popcorn or whatever you eat in replacement uh, of popcorn. And uh, enjoy that because that was frustrating. But anyway, yes, it means two different things. So when you say ameliorate diabetes, well, a lot of these people, once again, that's why I said alluding to the beginning, once again, they still exhibit an HbA1c level that given the context, I would say is still too high. And it's given the context, that's important once again. Plus a plant-based diet has been shown to improve insulin sensitivities. False, it has not been shown to improve anything actually, not anything at all, because improve is a cause and effect statement, but I covered that versus the insulin resistance, which is one of the main core mechanisms behind diabetes. It is a core mechanism behind it. It is not the cause of diabetes, really. And even if you want to call it the cause of diabetes, you cannot say that it is in and of itself the pathology because something is causing the insulin resistance. To and type 1. And uh, we've also shown that a plant-based diet is actually able to improve the... Whatever you're going to say, false. You can't say the word improve. That's not possible. You can use cause and effect statements when it comes to biochemical analyses if they are properly controlled. You are not referring to those, though. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong, and I will own up to that. But... Cell function, but this was done in people who are overweight and did not have any diabetes. So the question is, what can a plant-based diet do for people with type 1 diabetes? Uh, and these are the findings. Okay, look, effect of dietary intervention. And already, conjugate to cause, no. On insulin requirements and glycemic control in type 1 diabetes, 12-week randomized clinical trial. Oh, well, I mean, we already covered that, didn't we? Now, we just, now we're just actually getting to the actual title of the study. So wrong already. Supposed effects. You could have fixed the entire thing by just putting the word supposed in front of effect. They have just been published in uh, the uh, in the journal Clinical Diabetes. It's a journal by the American Diabetes Asso Association. A criminal association that gets all of its money from insulin manufacturers. That should give you a hint as to what their profit incentive is and therefore what <laughs> their um, veracity level is with respect to the information they promulgate to the masses. Uh, we enrolled 58 people with type 1 diabetes and assigned them randomly to follow e either a low-fat vegan diet that consisted of fruits and vegetables and whole grains and legumes or um, follow a portion control diet where you count the carbs and count your calories. Well, you can't count your caloric intake because, well, it's always zero. Please check out my calories playlist if you're new to the channel as to, well, why that is the case. I would recommend watching my video in response to Matt Walsh, conservative influencer. Um, do not 
conflate that with an opposing of conservative beliefs, if you actually have watched my channel long enough, you probably know that that's not the case, uh, but it doesn't mean that there aren't bad apples. And it also doesn't mean that even some good apples can't get things wrong, is what I should say. Anyway, um, but we get what you're saying, uh, counting, just basically restricting the mass of food intake, uh, but not controlling for the types of food you're consuming. Well, that's a recipe for disaster, isn't it? <laughs> In many respects. And both groups followed the diet for 12 weeks. That's not long enough. That is not long enough, no matter what intervention you're doing. Even if it can't establish cause and effect and you want to just get some um, judicious inferences from it or derive them from it, which these studies can be a little useful for, sure. Um, that's not long enough for this type of intervention, still. Now, the portion control diet, we told them to watch their portions, um, you know, watch their carbs. And so here's the thing, restrict carbohydrates. Well, how much? You're being a little vague. How, did you tell them to do it less than 20 grams a day? for example, or is it less than 100 grams a day, which is still, like, that means that your upper end is 99, which is ridiculous. And that also assumes that food labels are entirely accurate. They're not only not accurate with, with the caloric number, but they have to round values when it comes to everything else. Or if you get something that says that, well, a serving size has less than one gram of carbs in it, because that happens. Well, multiply the amount of serving size by each other. You, you won't be able to calculate the amount of carbs because all it says is less than one gram. So to be safe, you must assume always that it's one gram. Just treat it as one gram, and then you got your safety belt on. But anyway, cholesterol less than or equal. Well, we covered the cholesterol. Uh, any excess cholesterol that one consumes is simply recycled and or excreted by the body in the bile as is indicated at any given instance in time. If you knew lipoprotein metabolism, you would understand this. That's biochemistry right there. Lipoprotein metabolism is a complex situation. It's, it's occurring at all times in our body, but once you get it down, you understand this unequivocally to be the case. So there's no reason to control for your cholesterol levels, and neither uh, should you control for your cholesterol intake. You cannot overconsume cholesterol, really. The limit Any more than you can overconsume water or something. The cholesterol and saturated fat intake. The I covered that. Fat vegan diet. We told them... It Eat only vegan foods, no animal products. Keep the fat content up to 30 grams per day and favor foods with a low, with a low glycemic index. Okay, so the glycemic index is complete nonsense because that assumes that you can predict what a food's glycemic effect will be on every single given person on the face of the planet, which is not true. And that's also not to mention that you can't even do that for one individual person because that varies day to day. And it also depends on a myriad of factors like their activity level, the time of day, whether they're menstruating or not, if they're a f female. So <laughs> that's why I just say, well, instead of looking at the GI, the glycemic index, which can give a very, very rough estimate. Very rough. The signal to noise ratio is insane on that. Like I just said. And for the reasons I just stated, um, just look at carb content. Okay? I hate this whole, yes, and I'm gonna say the word hate. I hate this whole, well, carbs cause damage and glycation is like your body cooking from the inside out. Glucose goddess reference there. Um, so instead of just not consuming it, well, just consume another contraindication, actually, that being fiber, an enteric nervous system destroying, perniciously albeit, compound, to blunt a glucose spike. Well, why? Or, or, get the best part, buy my supplement that'll do it. <sighs> Don't buy their supplements, instead, buy mine. Stay tuned to the end of this video to find out more about those products, because um, they're not supplements at all. Because supplement implies that you are missing something in your diet, and you're replacing something that's missing in your diet. 
which is not the case. Anyway, let's continue. That means uh, use pumpernickel bread instead of white bread when you can. Yeah, we covered that though. Just don't eat bread. Bread yummy, but um, just don't do that. Interestingly, I'm not someone that actually likes, that misses pasta and bread and all that. I, I, there's no appetite in my brain whenever I think about it. Mine is, is the chocolate and stuff. Not even fruit. It's just chocolate. Chocolate type stuff. The, the, like the really bad stuff. Of course. Great. Knowing my luck, but... Brown rice over white rice and so on. Yeah, no. Don't do that. Brown rice actually has more anti-nutrients in it because the hull is where the plant depends on to protect it the most, actually, from predatory imposition. All participants used Dexcom G6, which is a continuous glucose monitoring system. So you basically... Those do have some error because they measure basically the glucose level in your interstitial fluid. Uh, so that can be disrupted by, they can give you a false reading, for example, if you are exercising, if you are taking a hot shower. Um, so yeah, temperature changes can change it. Um, instead of depending on a glucose monitor or a continuous glucose monitor, which are, they are extremely expensive. Um, just don't consume the carbohydrates. Or if you really want to, you can get one of those finger pricking things. And um, it'll measure your blood glucose level um, after an hour of eating. That can help if you think that you're consuming an, uh, too much protein if you're on carnivore. If you are not on carnivore yet, don't get a glucose monitor at all. What you need to do is get the carbohydrate consumption under control first. Wear a sensor under under your skin and you have access to your to your, to your sugar levels like throughout the whole day. It's a good estimate, I think, for the most part, but not the best. And if there's any error at all, I don't put too much emphasis on it. And uh, by sharing the data with us, the research team had also access to the data. It was pretty cool. You know, I was just like sitting at my laptop, opening up like the blood sugar of each participant at any time. Uh, it was amazing. And now... Oh. Chronometer? Really? Goodness me. This is like every bro science major's go-to site and app program. Uh, we encouraged people to also track all the meals using an app that's called Chronometer. Chrono if you want to talk about something that is not sustainable, it is tracking your food consumption like this. It is not. I've tried to do it just for fun on Carnivore, not because I actually felt it necessary. I just tried to do it for fun. And uh, I probably lasted about a week or two. And even within those two up to weeks, um... There were days that I missed. I mean, are you really going to sit there and do all the math? I did it. I like math. I, I loved it. I was like, oh, that's interesting that I'm eating that much protein. I'm eating that much fat. But, I mean, really? Which is a free app that you can download. It shows you, um, you know, like the nutritional breakdown. Uh, we asked them to do this because it was important to know how many carbohydrates they consumed with each meal. So with this app, you just put down like all the ingredients of a meal and voila, in a few seconds, you, you have how many grams of carbohydrate? No, that's extremely inaccurate because that depends on so many different things. One red pepper is different from the other. One type of bread is different than the other. I mean, oh, that's extremely rough. It's another problem with chronometer. So, by the way, if you wanted any more evidence that this, this study is garbage, sorry, ma'am, it's garbage. There it is, because the numbers are all out of whack now. Assuming, and that helps you 
estimate how much insulin you need. And we analyzed uh, the three... It's a very rough estimate. ...diet records at... It's very important that you actually dose your insulin responsibly because you go overboard, you get into hypoglycemia. And that'll kill you too. If it's significant enough. ...and then at the end of the study. Uh, we tracked insulin sensitivity uh, as a ratio between total carbohydrates and total insulin dose. And our part... Notice how she said that she tracked insulin sensitivity or they measured it um, when they didn't. There are proxy measures always because you can't measure insulin resistance. Depends also when... To, to get their labs uh, at LabCorp after an overnight fast. The primary... Out 10 to 12 hours is not a fast. Sorry. ...were total daily insulin dose, insulin sensitivity, and A1C as a marker of glycemic control. The second... Yeah, but you can't measure insulin sensitivity. And what was the first one? Total daily insulin dose. HbA1c is also conditional, but I'll give it a pass because these people are consuming carbohydrates. Activity and A1c as a marker of glycemic control. The secondary outcomes included body weight, blood lipids, and also kidney function, um, defined as blood urea nitrogen and bun to creatinine ratio. Creatinine is better. Blood urea nitrogen can increase when consuming more protein. It can increase above the normative level of the population because the normative level of the population is based on a population that is deranged and has a poor diet, almost invariably. For example, the very friend that I was talking to earlier, or talking about earlier, exhibited a higher blood urea nitrogen ratio at one point. So what? No symptoms whatsoever. If you know anything about urea and how that's created from things like, I don't know, um, ammonia, really ammonium, given the pKa value of, uh, of ammonium, um, then you know why that would be the case. Basically, just to give a little complicated one, it's not really that complicated, I, I, I don't think, but maybe, maybe it is. Amino acid metabolism results in what is called oxidative deamination in the liver and basically it causes a buildup of ammonium which enters the urea cycle to be converted into urea which will then migrate into the bloodstream and enter into the kidneys to be you to create urine basically or to at least contribute to urine that's what it is and amino acids what are those well they're constituents of protein so the reason they use it as a marker, uh, they, they really use it as a marker of muscle damage or potential muscle damage because your muscles are made out of amino acids. And so that can also result from muscle breakdown. Um, but creatinine is more, I think, uh, reliable. We used ANOVA for repeated measures for statistical analysis. Now let's look at the changes in both groups. Uh, let's start with the nutrition, uh, with, with, with changes in their nutrition. Okay, so look at this graph, energy intake. You don't consume energy, you don't intake energy. That's not how that works. The food that you do consume is not reflective of the amount of energy yielded from that food either, because if all of the food was converted into energy, for example, whether it be chemical or heat energy, which is what calories are, heat energy, um, then you would be effulgent every time you ate food because E equals MC squared. That equation tells you that there is a massive amount of energy contained within even the smallest molecule. Really. So you eat a pound of ground beef. The energy in that equals the mass of that times the speed of light squared. Now look up how much the speed of light is and then square that value. Anyway, you don't yield energy from your food, really. You can make the argument that you indirectly yield energy from your food in the form of chemical potential energy, a construct, and the thing that we have to invoke in order to explain what actually f occurs in the body, because there's really no proof of that. 
but for the sake of the argument, well, sure. But it has, you, you do not know how much of the mass that you consume will actually just be excreted and not converted into calories, which your body doesn't use anyway, okay? For example, fecal matter, urine, uh, water vapor at the lungs, carbon dioxide at the lungs. All of those are metabolic byproducts. They are the result of your food breaking down and being metabolized, or at least the constituents of it. It also doesn't take into consideration how many calories, and yes, I actually am going to use that because we do release calories in the form of heat. Yes, it's called entropy. Are released from fat cells when they're uncoupled. Which occurs when you have low insulin. Or lower homeostatic insulin. So when you're not consuming carbs. So you actually will release more calories per the same amount of food if you have lower insulin over time because of an uncoupling of one's fat cells. Also talked about that in my book. Ben Bickman also actually talked about that. Just to give him credit. The energy intake did not change significantly in either group. Uh, in the vegan group... Didn't change at all because they don't intake energy. It's important to get this down. That's not me being captious and pedantic and trivial. That is important to get down because it completely skews results. Hormones don't have an effect on calories. They have an effect on mass. And all mass is different and all calories are the same. Carbohydrate intake increased significantly uh, while the fat intake dropped significantly and protein stayed about the same. Uh, on the portion control diet, uh, people uh, basically kept the ratio between the macronutrients. Now, let's look at the results. Total daily insulin dose did not change on the portion control diet. Uh, but it dropped by 12 units a day on average in the in the vegan group. Well, we already covered that, didn't we? We already covered why that would be the case. When you consume fatty acids and glucose in a significant amount, both in a relatively significant amount in a mixed meal, you are grinding your gears, so to speak, in the body. The mitochondria are only able to oxidize basically one or the other regularly and continuously. Okay, and it's because of the Randall cycle. There is inertia involved. If the energy level in the cells that are oxidizing fatty acids does not fall below a certain level because the amount of fatty acids within the bloodstream and therefore available to the cell remains constant or actually increases in the case of a mixed meal and you eat fat, then the glucose will be locked out. The glucose can be pushed in when the energy level inside the cell decreases enough via inferred from the redox potential. Well, not really inferred, via the redox potential itself. What the Randall cycle tells us is that you should not be consuming a, a diet that consists of both fatty acids and glucose in any significant amount equally. What does that mean? What is the implication? What is the application of that? Either eat a diet that is extremely poor in fat and rich in carbohydrates, or do the exact opposite. Now, one of those is a diet that is indicated for human beings and one that we've consumed for four and a half million years. The other, not so much, and it's a dangerous diet, bereft and destitute of necessary nutrients for the human body. You can do a vegan diet for years, sometimes over a decade, I've seen. That's more rare, but it happens. Those people do not look good. That's an opinion, but not in my opinion. They don't look good. And they usually, if you inquire more, they do have health issues. Still. Most vegans I've seen blame it on parasites. It's about 28% on average. There were people who dropped their insulin dose by 50%, five zero. That's huge. Uh, insulin sensitivity. And, and also that's good for them. That's great. And I'm glad. 
it's sort of in a way, and I'm not trying to be like selfish here, but um, I don't know if that's the best word. It's also sort of unfortunate because imagine if someone had done this and told them to do the carnivore diet instead, but now that they've basically dropped their insulin, the faith that they have in the plant-based diet and the vegan diet is going to be far higher. And so it's going to be far, it would be far harder, far more difficult to convince them in the opposite direction than it otherwise would have been if they hadn't done this protocol. So in that way, it's a little unfortunate, but again, it, it's good. It's good. Agree significantly on the vegan on the vegan diet with and no change on the portion control diet. Uh, the increase on the vegan diet was more than a hundred percent. It was just incredible. Proxy measures were used, but anyway, okay, fine. We covered this though. Insulin sensitivity is just the yang to the yin that is insulin resistance. And we cover what insulin resistance is. It's not cellular tinnitus. It's not even, at least always, cellular dysfunction. It is a cellular stimulus to prevent glucose administration at the behest of insulin. Randall cycle. That is absolutely what it is. Uh, the A1C uh, was reduced uh, as a marker of glycemic control was reduced in... A conditional marker of glycemic control. Again, I'll give you a pass. I'm being very forgiving here. ...groups with no significant difference between, between the diets. A body weight did not change on the portion control diet, but it was reduced by 11.5 pounds or 5.2 kilograms on the vegan diet. But total cholesterol. By the way, what was the sample size here? I, I'd be curious to know. Do I actually have the gumption, the impetus to go and look up the study? No, but I'll uh, I'll express my piqued interest and curiosity without actually embarking upon the extremely transient journey of just looking up the study. But that matters too. I just want to throw that out there more on the vegan diet oh yes cholesterol and the ldl cholesterol which isn't cholesterol it's a lipid protein so just remove the word cholesterol here it's ldl um that dropped no surprises there the body will only encode for ldl if it has uh, pressure to encode for it as a result of increased cholesterol consumption or or actually really i should say presence if i'm going to be more accurate in in the blood when you absorb fats or when you consume fats and cholesterol, they get absorbed in the chylomicrons and they get transported all across the body. They go through the lipoprotein metabolism. LDL is part of that lipoprotein metabolism pathway towards the end of it, really, actually. So if you're not consuming as much cholesterol, why would your body encode for the production of LDL particles? Not gonna happen. So anyway, this doesn't surprise me. Also, just fun fact, Cholesterol synthesis in the body, the endogenous pathway, because what it's my opinion that you should be consuming it. That's how you should be deriving your cholesterol uh, and yielding it. But if you impose a demand on the body to produce it because you're not consuming it, uh, the cholesterol synthesis pathway is about 30 steps long. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it is arduous because we're talking about equilibriums and all that stuff. And it doesn't matter how many steps it is, it still occurs quite fast. And if it has the resources, it'll it'll synthesize it. Um, but what that does tell me is that since it takes more resources to do that, it makes me question how much of those resources are actually more so to be used for something else, which would therefore reduce the amount of cholesterol that would be yielded, which would therefore mean that the body in that situation would only be producing as much as it needs to survive, but not as much as it actually desires to have. important. Well, cholesterol was reduced only on the vegan diet. And now well, who cares? If anything, it's a bad thing. The function improved significantly as inferred from blood urea nitrogen, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. But um, anyway, they probably they're probably doing it because urea should be filtered out in the kidneys. And if there's excessive amounts of blood urea in the uh, blood, 
then it's a sign that the kidney isn't excreting as much as it should. Yes, whatever. Fine. But, anyway. When we're talking about the body, it does get complicated very fast. Urea nitrogen dropped on the vegan diet, and the bantocreatinine ratio was reduced on the vegan diet as well. So, in summary... The and those could be indicative of, of improvements, but there's... It's not guaranteed. Those are markers, again. Important that we specify that. Were they symptomatic, for example? In control diet improved the A1C as a marker of glycemic control and total cholesterol. That's it. No, when you say improved total cholesterol, that implies that an elevated level, quote unquote, um, above the normative level of the population, of course, that's what we mean by elevated or what they mean by elevated, is necessarily at all times a bad thing, which it isn't. And we covered that, didn't we? Improved HbA1c. If I wanted to get extremely pedantic, and really what I mean by pedantic is accurate, um, that's conditional. To say that an A1c was improved implies that an increase is necessarily at all times a bad thing, and a decrease is necessarily at all times a good thing. Far more complicated than that. I already said that I'm going to give you a pass on, on this, because my opinion would be congruous with yours, with respect to the HbA1c value, but I already covered why that would be the case. I think it covered everything. What a shock. The vegan diet improved all the outcomes. It reduced... The well, again, with the word improved. And also, by the way, by the way, I never even touched on, which I need to reiterate this, reiterate. You cannot say the vegan diet improved it because that's a cause and effect statement anyway. So that also, to go back to the other one, the mixed macro diet that you were just referring to, same thing there. Even if you were going to say that those were necessarily improvements, if it's up, it's bad in terms of the HbA1c, if it's down, it's good, always. And same thing with cholesterol, it's up, it's bad, if it's down, it's good. Well, you still can't say the vegan diet improved it because that's saying that, you, that it caused those changes and it didn't. Or at least you can't say it didn't either. There's no evidence to support the fact that it did or support the claim that it did. You can't say that. False. I and mean, you can. You have the right to. Um, it's irresponsible, though. And it needs to be addressed. The demand for insulin, it improved insulin sensitivity. It improved... A construct. Semic control, total and LDL cholesterol, it reduced... No such thing as LDL cholesterol. Nonsense. False. Also, once again, with the word improved. Weight and it also improved kidney function. Ostensibly. So the vegan diet was was superior. A well, that's an opinion, isn't it? The portion. And also, once again, cause and effect. Implications here. Raw diet because it improved all the cardiometabolic outcomes. Mm -hmm. And no, because now you are infer you are implying with that that those are all risk factors and there are no risk factors at all that can be established. So therefore, there are no risk factors in human nutrition science. None. I mean, reducing the insulin dose, that's kind of unheard of, you know, in terms of um, what... Well, that's sad. I mean, it's not unheard of for me. <laughs> wow. Look up, uh, look into Dr. Ryan Attar. Or Atar. I don't know where the accent is. I think it's Atar. But anyway, um, who is a type 1 diabetic that is on carnivore and has to take very little insulin on a quotidian basis? What nutrition can do. Now, an important question is, is there any benefit of a vegan diet beyond weight loss? Because someone may be... Thinking well, okay. To play devil's advocate, of course there is. Well, didn't you just cover this with glycemic control? Well, of course, these people lost weight, it improved their insulin sensitivity, and that's why their insulin requirements uh, were reduced. Well, to answer the question if there is any benefit beyond weight loss, we standardized uh, insulin dose per kilogram of body weight. So no change in the on the portion control diet, 
but a 24% reduction on the vegan diet. Also, by the way, just again, to be accurate, so again, you can call it pedantic, but it's just being accurate. Every single time that you said no change, that's not true. There has been a change. <laughs> There's, it's slight, but there is a change. Um, anyway, once again, I mean, I've, I've pretty much covered everything. This is to be expected. I mean, insulin is a fat-storing hormone, but you eliminate hyperglycemia, you're not going to store as much fat. Because glucose won't be transmuted into fatty acids to then synthesize triglycerides to then be stored as much, at least. There you go. Also, a vegan diet tends to ameliorate lots of inflammation. Not all of it, though. And in fact, it can cause inflammation for different reasons as well. Because of plants and fiber. And uh, that was a reduction. So plants. You know, point... Um, one five units of kil per, per kilogram per, per day, and this reduction in insulin dose would would translate into a reduction in cardiovascular risk by nine percent. What the hell are you talking about? Now that's the worst irresponsibility that I've seen in this video with your rhetoric. Once again, no. Because now you've just established a cause and effect relationship between insulin injection and cardiovascular disease risk and occurrence. No. That's not true. And by the way, even if you, now, the reason I said that this is the worst bit of irresponsibility I've seen here is because it's not even accurate to state this by replacing the word risk with association or something. No, because just because you saw an association between a set of insulin injection and a, per a, a percentage of cardiovascular disease prevalence increased as compared and contrasted with the other population, you can't say that that association will be seen if you decrease the insulin injection or if you increase the percentage of cardiovascular disease and see how the insulin would respond in a, in a computational way. You can't do that. Now you, you, you cannot do that. So even, even saying that this is an association, that's not true. <laughs> you can't guarantee that because now you've just made up your own association that you would expect to see. So that's a hypothesis. What? That's bad. Sorry, Dr. Hannah Kaliova. No. Your vascular risk by 9%, but there were, you know, other improvements as well. Uh, so the reduction in A1... Improvements are opinions. To say improvement like that is an opinion. You didn't say, just now, you didn't say that the vegan diet caused the improvements. You may be implying it, but once again, I'll be forgiving. Let's just say you're not saying that. There were improvements after this study was done. So it therefore implies association. Still, that's an opinion because you just called a decrease in cholesterol levels an improvement. That's an opinion, isn't it? By 0.8% on the vegan diet, would be uh, would correspond to a 12% reduction in cardiovascular risk. No, you cannot say would do that. This is a hypothesis. And even then, even if you were going to frame it as a hypothesis, you'd still be wrong in using the word risk. Because the study wouldn't even be able to establish that if you were to do a study to see if that hypothesis were correct because that's a cause and effect statement. And the 20% reduction in LDL cholesterol, uh, not cholesterol, covered that, correspond to a 20% reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. Covered that too, same thing. So like, rewind my video. The health benefits are just incredible and we're not. So you've now just made a causal relationship 
um, or you've claimed that you've established one between a vegan diet and all of these outcomes that you claim to be improvements, which cannot be claimed as improvements. And by the way, the ones on the screen here are not the improvements that were even seen in the study. If the study were to be able to establish improvements, there are hypotheses of what you would expect to see if you actually did another study. And even then, the way that you framed these were not appropriate hypotheses to be making because you wouldn't even be able to test these hypotheses out because you used the word risk and there are no studies that are able to inform upon risk. So many things wrong here. So many. Verklempt I am. <laughs> wow, guys. I mean, really? Come on. You can do better. Talking about how insulin is expensive and that people were saving money on insulin. That's so fantastic. I am glad. That is good. I'd love for them to migrate to my channel and take that to a further level and optimize their health in many other ways as well and optimize it even better in the way that is concerned right now by cutting the carbs completely and eating fat and protein to satiety. In short, you know, when you want to choose the best diet for type 1 diabetes. In short, if you want to choose the best diet for type 1 diabetes, do not listen to these people. Do not listen to these people. Unfortunately, they are misled. I have no ill feelings towards these people, particularly right now, from what I've seen. Okay, she seems genuinely well-intentioned, and that's good, that's great. It does not mean that it is voracious information, and it's not, in fact. The low-fat vegan diet is the way to go. No, that is an opinion, and it's based on fallacious statistical inference here. So, let me unshare my screen and open it up for questions yeah that is fascinating stuff um I, while you were talking there, i was like all right how many people are using insulin on a daily basis just here in the u.s and it turns out that it's over nine million people um so uh, it's a shame i guess my first question is have you heard from any pharmaceutical companies yet over the course of the month when this study's been out who maybe dr kaliova aren't exactly too happy with the findings that you and your team found yeah, that's a great question, Chuck. Uh, have you seen the headlines that some some forms of insulin, you know, have lower uh, availability these days, and you know, you cannot even get some uh, some kinds of insulin and some brands. Uh, so, you know, the findings are critical. Uh, some pharma companies may not be happy about it, um, but yeah, it's for the benefit of people. As always, as you know, that's why we do our research. No question about it. Did you do your research? She's a PhD, so she does have the ability to do that. I wonder, I didn't see the authors of the paper. If this is her study, then once again, I'm still not impressed. It could have been the best that you could have done in a study, but the reporting was irresponsible. It really was. It was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry to anyone who has been beguiled by this information. Now, if you've stumbled upon my channel here, please subscribe and binge it to learn more. <laughs> Be careful with treading towards the beginning of my channel where I was far more angry for the camera. <laughs> far more abrasive there. And you mentioned the cost. I, there was a three-year stretch between 2020 and 2023 where I believe the cost of insulin rose by more than 50%. I think it was 54% over that. That's interesting. What changed in the United States during that time period? Oh, goodness. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that the prices seem to be going up a lot recently with everything, wood, especially. Can't build anything, that's, anyway.
<laughs> I need, I, I gotta make another channel for talks about that stuff. And, and yeah, we have seen some decreases, but they've been modest compared to that huge surge. I think we're talking about maybe a 10% de uh, decrease since that time. And, and so it is incredibly expensive. And then I think back to the findings of a previous study uh, that you did where you were looking at the cost of eating a whole food plant-based diet um, and how inexpensive that can be, even compared to the standard diet that we're all used to eating. Um, and it's it's just mind-blowing. So for me, you're saying... Yeah, ask any carnivore how expensive their meals are or their, their shopping sprees are. And in fact, you will almost invariably see that it is the cheapest that they've ever experienced. In fact, whenever I was buying lots of plants for my plant-based diet, because it was plant-based, it wasn't vegan, I was never fully vegan. I was, well, my father at the time, because I was much younger, uh, was buying, he was spending a lot more money on food and not all of it would be eaten because the plants would go bad in a matter of days. So, <laughs> but yes, I'm sure that a vegan diet would be more inexpensive than buying a bunch of meat and plants. Yes. Uh, one, you're saving money at the bank, but two, uh, as a diabetes sufferer, you very well could be saving your life as well. That's two very big wins, Dr. Kaliova. Absolutely. We're talking about thousands of dollars each year that people with diabetes spend on insulin and, you know, some uh, some of the technology they need for managing their diabetes, uh, but also on medications for their high blood pressure, for their for their blood lipids. Uh, and so if we can save them, uh, you know, a significant uh, portion of this of this money that's set aside for for medical costs, plus they can also save on groceries. Come on. You can have a nice vac vacation and, uh, you know, still have more money in the bank. That's a win-win for sure. And um, I, I want to ask you kind of a technical question about the study as well. Uh, you're talking about giving them a chronometer, asking them to log the foods to track their micros and macronutrients. I'm curious, beyond the parameters that you gave them uh, as far as just low fat or anything like that, was there anything specific that you gave them in terms of a mix? It looks, looks to be the case that he's having some delay on his speaker that <laughs> they needed to follow, or was it just here are your parameters, do the best that you can within them? Uh, yeah, they were able to choose whichever meals, uh, you know, they, they liked. Uh, we gave them some suggestions and a dietitian also worked with them individually uh, to make sure they know exactly, you know, what they're going to eat. Oh, a dietitian worked with them. That's, uh, that's even worse. That really is worse. Um, most of them are insufferable pricks, by the way. Not all of them. At least the ones online, but, you know, online world is fake, so, you know, who knows, but anyway, that's a shame still with what they're taught. But the, the exact menu was up to them. We gave them suggestions um, that came from uh, Dr. Barnard's book uh, and... Oh, no. Neil Barnard. With all due respect to Neil, I would tell people to just take one good look at Neil and tell me if he is someone that you would be willing to take dietary advice from. Me personally, I would not. Based on solely his appearance, and knowing the context behind why he looks that way. From my understanding, he has no health problems, diagnosed health problems and genetic conditions and all the serious stuff that would cause him to look like that. If he is following his own advice and he looks like that, which would not surprise me, then I would not want to take advice from him. Since I believe that is already the case, that is why I'm not doing it. I'm not the pinnacle of male physique at the moment, but I also do have valid excuses for that. So. 
book on reversing diabetes. Uh, and uh, yeah, you could. I'm sure that his information allows people to ameliorate their diabetes, but we covered that. For breakfast, you could have oatmeal with. Don't do that. Ever. At all. No matter what. With berries or tofu scrambled. Don't have tofu. Berries are okay to have in very significant moderation. I usually don't tell people to moderate carbs at all because that's like telling people to moderate alcohol. Not a good. Not a good slogan. Okay. Just don't make them blueberries because those have now been hybridized to be extremely sweet and sugary. Raspberries, blackberries. There you go. Uh, but you could have also leftovers from from last night, some bean burritos and or vegetable soup or lentil soup. Uh, you know, yeah, people were able to uh, to like, just uh, put their preferences into their in, into their meal choices. So stay tuned. More definitely to come. That is exciting stuff. Dr. Kaliova, thank you so very much for your research. As always, fascinating findings. And I commend you and your team for another groundbreaking study. Thanks so much. Okay. Well, we got through the whole thing. Um, this video is going to be quite long, therefore. But anyway, um, yes, a type 1 diabetic and a type 2 diabetic can see vast improvement in blood sugar regulation and therefore subsequent um insulin injection frequency, uh, a decrease in it, by adopting a plant-based diet. Um, is that the most indicated approach for one's physiology as a human being? No, it is not. And if you would like to understand why, I would recommend either buying my book, Contraindicated, a closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century, uh, edition one, um, if you have not already, or binge my YouTube channel um, after subscribing and liking this video and commenting your thoughts below as well, by the way. Um, or subscribing to the Patreon uh, to gain access to more uploads. One extra upload per week. So, anyway, with that being said, let's get on to the really important thing. What is that, you may ask? Well, that has to do with the link on the bottom of the screen. What is that link? Well, that is a link that will bring you to an amazing site with amazing products from an amazing brand known as Cerule. If you purchase product through that link, you will get a permanent, permanent 10% discount and free shipping discount when signing up for monthly deliveries. If you would like to learn more about those products, like who should take them, why you should take them, when to take them, what they even are in the first place, which I would recommend anyone do before buying anything at all, of course, I would refer to the link in the top right corner of the screen, the Cerule products link, that is a complete elucidation and explanation of all of those things and more. And I would also further migrate to the description below to find a video between myself and Professor Bart K on these products in far further detail, as well as the company of Cerule itself, which is quite important, I think. Finally, email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com if you have any questions regarding anything at all. And with that being said, Join me next time when we react to someone else that may very well have good intentions, and I respect the intentions a lot from this woman, but do not quite have it down in terms of scientific interpretation, statistical in in interpretation, um, as well as, well, diet recommendations. So, till then.